Hello there. Welcome to the Saroy channel, wherever you are in the world. And I do hope you're doing exceedingly well. I'm doing fabulous. Thank you very much. And do you know what? I've just got very excited hearing from all of you about the different concoctions that you tend to drink because it's incredible the personal choices we have out there, like the people that drink beer or red wine or white wine or who enjoy pink lemonade or Irish coffee. There's so much different taste out there. So it's really rather exciting to hear from you what it is that you enjoy drinking. Um, I personally love cups of tea. I love white chocolate a latte and I occasionally like a hot chocolate because I always have enjoyed that. So those are my favourites. So let's get started with tonight's story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, my name is Penelope Blackwood and I was born and raised in the Pacific Northwest. And when I got married to my husband Russell in 1994, we both moved into the double story cottage in the far left hand corner of his parents' sizable ranch. Russell's parents still resided in the main 1800s farmhouse where my husband had grown up as a young boy. And they ran their horse ranch from the main homestead that was exceedingly well equipped and furnished with premier stable blocks and storage barns. There was a long, smooth tarmac road that led to the main house, with two signs, one that pointed straight ahead, which was signposted with the words, Saddled Horse Ranch and the other one strategically pointed down the fork turning in the road, which was signposted with the words, Green Orchard Cottage. When you turned down that little rugged, precipitous road, it led to our 1800s cottage that had belonged to the original caretaker of the land, along with his family in the 1800s. This delightful, charming abode was steeped and marinated in a rich, vibrant history that remained on the land like a long-lost, forgotten friend vacant, neglected and unused for over 50 long years. So my husband and I had jazzed up the place, reviving, reawakening and recapturing its original essence with some fresh paint whilst restoring some of the damaged ceilings and a few other little maintenance jobs to bring the cottage up to speed. We even added on a wraparound porch in keeping with the style of the cottage in order to be able to enjoy and appreciate the ravishing panoramic views over the pretty Bridge Creek the mountains and the forest. I think Russell and I were secretly hoping to enjoy a spot of bird watching from that porch from time to time. Once the very moderate renovations were at last complete, the cottage was incredibly beguiling. It was like we had brought it back to life from the dead, like a blackened old silver kettle that had been heavily tarnished over years of forsaken neglect and had been buffed up to its former magnificent glory. I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say it would not have looked out of place on a box of Swiss chocolates because it was so magical and enchanting and was more in sequence with something out of a poetic, whimsical fairy tale than our reality. Even my husband would joke to me and say, Where are the fairies? And the elves, sweetheart? They ought to be around here somewhere. I knew exactly what he meant because if fairies and elves are real, our character-rich cottage would be the quintessential place for them to be found. The cottage was a white-bricked home with a stone facade and was heavily flanked by the most incredible dreamy alpine forest. These robust statuesque trees clung to the mountains on the rear of our property rather like oysters on a rock, covering them in a dreamy, verdant, bushy ombrage. On the right-hand side of our property were pretty flowery meadows where my husband's father's horses would be trotting around the fenced-in fields and grazing the pastures happily. I loved watching those horses. It was such a joy for me. And they would often lean over the fence, hoping for an apple or a carrot from me. And they were rarely ever disappointed, as I was always willing to oblige them with a treat. Russell and I were exceedingly excited to move into this vibrant, beautiful cottage, and I couldn't have asked to live in a more appealing, romantic space that I had transformed with eclectic pieces of vintage furniture that were harmonious to the cottage's rich history. I've always been a very down-to-earth person who's never believed in ghostly phenomena or the paranormal before. But I assure you, the moment we moved into the property, I sensed a presence of or energy, if you like, in our home, but I thought I was going mad and was imagining things. Sometimes I would hear heavy footfall walking down our sweeping staircase, or I would turn around to look at who was coming, and there would be nobody there. Yet I could almost feel someone there looking at me. 
Was I going stark raving mad, I would wonder to myself, over and over again? Then there were of course multiple occasions where in my peripheral vision I was almost certain I discerned a fleeting shadow, but once again when I turned around to look, I could see nothing. If that was not disturbing enough, there were times when my golden retriever Carmiel would rise up on his haunches, wagging his tail profusely and barking happily, as if he was greeting someone joyfully, but we saw no one standing there. One day when I was standing at the kitchen sink, washing dishes after dinner in the early evening, when it was still relatively light outside, I happened to glance outside the kitchen window and could see a man walking towards the bridge on the creek, which in itself was decidedly odd, because this man should have been nowhere near our property, as it was private land. But he was wearing clothes indicative of another time, and he had an eccentric-looking walrus moustache on his face, growing down the outer edges of his mouth, which was an unusual feature in itself for our modern times, and not something you most commonly see in our day and age. I quickly ran towards the lake, calling after the strange man. Hi there! Can I help you? Sir, can I help you? The man stopped for a moment and turned around, looking directly at me, with a warm smile on his face that was so charming and prepossessing. All of a sudden, his image just suddenly faded, dematerializing before my eyes like a vaporous mist, and one second he was there, and then he was gone. I was suddenly hit with the stark awesome revelation and confounded realization that I had seen a ghost. I mean, what else could it possibly have been? I was so bemused and flummoxed that I kept saying to Russell over and over again, Oh my goodness! I'm almost certain I've just seen a ghost. I was later to learn from Russell that he had seen the ghost of the caretaker very frequently as a young child growing up, especially when he'd been playing around the creek with his younger siblings. Why on earth didn't you tell me about the ghost of the caretaker? I asked him. Because, Penelope, sweetheart, he had piped, you are the most cynical person I've ever met. I knew I wouldn't convince you of such a thing as ghosts, so I figured out to myself that the caretaker would make himself known to you sooner or later, and only then would you believe. He's been haunting this land for many centuries, and everyone who lives here has seen him, and it was only a matter of time before you saw him too. Why is he still hanging around here? I asked my husband. Perhaps he's attached to the land, my husband suggested. After all, he was the original caretaker here. I've never got the impression he's unhappy or lost. I think he enjoys hanging around and watching over the place. Maybe he believes he's still managing the affairs of the homestead from beyond the grave. My father swore once that the ghost had woken him up when one of the horses was struggling to give birth. And thanks to the caretaker, mother and foal were absolutely fine. Another anomalous thing that happened in our household is that I lost things from time to time, like my reading glasses, for example. I would look everywhere for them, which was a regular event for me, as I can be rather scatterbrained at the best of times. Invariably, I would magically find them replaced on my pillow. And this happened with everything, from keys to credit cards to even a small garden trowel that I lost once and couldn't find anywhere. As a result, I promptly decided that the ghost of the old caretaker, whom had lived in the cottage in the 1800s, was still taking care of things from beyond the grave, and I never regarded his presence in our home as unwanted or unpleasant. In fact, I believed his presence was welcome, as the ghost was more of a help rather than a hindrance. I gather his name was Gabe Beswick, and so if I sensed he was around, I would say, Hello, Gabe. If I had lost something, I would say, Gabe, I'm missing my tweezers. Have you seen them? Sure enough, I would find them later perched on my pillow. I think the ghost of Gabe rather liked me, because I promised you on birthdays and Christmases without fail, I would find a pretty wild flower or rose on my pillow. And this is still going on this very day. So my husband teases me relentlessly and tells me that my secret admirer is not of this world, and this is a long-standing joke with all our family members. My story that ultimately led to my Bigfoot encounter happened in 2015, when my son Adam was turning 13 years old at the time. 
It all began when we decided to throw a fabulous party for Adam during the summer months, as the delightful weather was fabulously sunny, so it was the perfect occasion to host the most spectacular, wonderful party for him under the stars, along with a tented sleepover for the kids. My husband Russell hitched up a large tent for this purpose, and the guests were always asked to bring along their sleeping bags and pyjamas. Even a dance floor had been hired and was placed outside on the lawn, along with a pre-programmed stereo system for all the music. I do remember we lit up pretty paper lanterns everywhere to light up the entire yard. It looked magical and welcoming that night. There was a large fire pit and a carcass of lamb and pork cooking on the spit, and the delicious aroma from the food wafted over the entire countryside, ensuring that every single stomach was rumbling and the people more than a little eager to eat the tendulant, succulent cuts of melt-in-the-mouth meat. The whole lawn was decked out with tables and chairs, swathed in white tablecloths with hot air balloons tied to the chairs. My sister Janine had arrived from Florida with her husband and her 16-year-old son Jonathan, who was staying with us at the time. Unfortunately, Jonathan was a belligerent, pugnacious and confrontational teenager who was always getting into all kinds of trouble, and was rather a negative influence on my son at the best of times. On the day of the exciting party, my sister and I were preparing all kinds of delicious sumptuous salads and dishes in the kitchen, along with a very large fruit punch made with passion fruit, lemonade, pineapple and orange juice, and ubiquitous pieces of chopped fruit. My son had insisted that this was the main drink he wanted to serve at the party, as it tasted absolutely delicious. Oh, I sincerely hope Jonathan is not up to something mischievous and roguish, said my sister, looking at me ever so uneasily. Have you noticed the way he and Adam have been whispering to each other non-stop all day and giggling? Oh, when Jonathan behaves like a delinquent and starts giggling all the time, I get a distinct chill down my spine. I sense he has a huge prank up his sleeve, and believe me, you don't want to be on the receiving end of one of his puckish jokes. It's a wonder my hair hasn't turned white from all the stress that kid's put me through. You never told me any of this, I said, looking at my sister in horror. What kind of pranks are we talking about, Janine? Believe me, you don't really want to know, said Janine. I don't think I should tell you. It might scare you half to death. Do I want to know, I piped. Of course I want to know, Janine. We're having a thirteen-year-old party and the last thing I want to do is upset a bunch of overprotective parents whose kids have been scared half to death by one of your son's frolicsome jokes. I'll never live it down when I pick up Adam after school at the gates. I assure you, some of his friend's parents are stick in the muds at the best of times. The last thing I need is to be assaulted by an avalanche of disapproving looks and underhand whispers, not to mention derogatory comments. Well, wait until Adam gets to 16 years old, sighed Janine, and then you'll see what I'm going through. I don't know, maybe it's just my son and his rampaging hormones, but his impish jokes have really been giving me some major scares. Last week I came home from my weekly shopping at Walmart, armed with my shopping bags, and as I was walking into the kitchen, this huge crocodile came sliding towards me on its belly, pushing its body forward with his clawed feet and its wide jaws were half open, exposing its pernicious, perilous, razor-sharp teeth. Its large, jagged tail was thrashing violently across my kitchen floor. I was so terrified that I dropped all my shopping bags, splattering the floor with broken eggs and spilled milk. I ran out of there so fast, screaming at the top of my lungs, and Jonathan and his best friend Nicholas were almost wetting themselves they were laughing so much at my frenzied reaction and frantic outcry. They rarely got off on scaring me half to death. It wasn't even remotely funny. I'm sure it wasn't. Where did that crocodile come from, I asked, looking absolutely appalled. I have no idea, Penelope. I don't ask him those kind of questions, said Janine, oscillating her arms in frustration. Frankly, Penelope, the less I know, the better. As far as I'm concerned. You're scaring me, I said. I couldn't handle it if he did something cocky and impudent at Adam's party. Oh, please speak to him on my account, Janine. I'm begging you. Tell him that he'll be on the receiving end of my wrath 
if he does anything untoward and inauspicious at this party of mine. I'm glad to say the party appeared to be going swimmingly well. Well, so I thought at the time. Based on my seemingly ambiguous and pseudo-appearances, that on the surface gave me the distinct overall impression that everybody appeared to be having a remarkably good time, dancing, drinking and eating to their heart's content. The ambience was very energised, relaxed and convivial. It would seem that the kids were piling their plates up with delicious food as if they hadn't eaten for months and were frankly half-starved. It also appeared that the fruity punch had been more than a huge hit, for everyone was drinking it with an unquenchable thirst, and so my sister made several more buckets of the stuff. I was mortified to see that my golden retriever had been given punch in his water bowl, but he seemed to have enjoyed it, which in itself was rather peculiar. It was only after one of the young 13-year-old girls, a girl called Abigail Fletcher, approached me giggling happily and slurring her words, that I realised suddenly that something was seriously off. Mrs. Blackwood, ah, this is the best party ever. <laughs> it's a great, great party. <laughs> All of a sudden, she promptly vomited over my dress. I was now drenched in this pixated young girl's vomit, and in disgusted revulsion, I promptly dashed upstairs, quickly showering and getting changed into something else. When I returned downstairs, I could see that there were several young 13-year-olds passed out on the lawn, clearly completely comatose, and this informed me that the kids had definitely been drinking alcohol. There was no other explanation for this outlandish behaviour. The kids in their spaced-out, intoxicated stupor were literally staggering around aimlessly and giggling at everything finding the most ordinary mundane things hilariously amusing. Two kids were pointing at my garden hose. It's going to burst with water. <laughs> and then we'll be wet. <laughs> and they doubled over with laughter. Even my own sister Janine should have been ashamed of her behaviour, as she was about as much help as a boiled lobster. She was sitting on a sofa, seemingly inebriated, drinking copious amounts of punch, and telling me, Oh, it's, this is really good, sis. She slurred between several hiccups and giggles. <laughs> it's really good. I so wish my husband and brother-in-law were on hand to help me, but after having carved the meat and set up the stereo system for me, they had subsequently made themselves scarce and gone away fishing together for the rest of the whole weekend. This was a complete, total and utter disaster as far as I was concerned, and everybody was bladdered, with one exception, and that is yours truly. I wasn't quite sure how to handle this precarious situation that was getting more out of hand with every passing minute. The punch had clearly been heavily spiked, and I immediately ventured towards the huge bucket to test it myself, and circumspectly tasted the suspicious concoction that seemed rather fine. I couldn't detect any evidence or obvious telltale signs of alcohol, but I gingerly discerned a glass bottle surreptitiously poking out from beneath the tablecloth, and to my total dismay there were dozens of empty bottles of vodka that had been hidden from discerning adult eyes. How much alcohol had these kids been drinking, I wondered in horror. I knew who the obvious offenders and perpetrators of this juvenile, insidious, duplicitous crime were, and they were no other than my nephew Jonathan and my son Adam. However, when I went to reprimand both boys, they were as responsive as a pair of groggy, dazed, hibernating squirrels, and were lying passed out on the lawn, perched up against the tent next to my golden retriever, Carmiel, who was lying on his back, snoring loudly, exposing his fleshy belly. For goodness sake, even my own dog was completely pickled. Could things get any worse than this? I tried to arouse my ossified, bombed-out dog, but his eyes rolled back in his head and he glanced up at me briefly and began to snore even louder. Louder than I've ever heard him snore before. Although passed out, he did look exceedingly content and very cock-eyed. All of a sudden I felt a cold hand on my back, and it was so icy I felt as if I'd been hit by a blast of freezing cold air, which was very discernible as it was a very warm evening. I turned around to see he was trying to get my attention, but no one was there, 
and then in my ear I heard an audible, deep guttural male voice saying, The creek! The creek! Get to the creek! In hindsight, I vehemently believe to this day that this was the spectral voice of the ghostly caretaker, Mr. Gay Beswick, alerting me to a potential problem on our land. Oh my goodness, I thought, and the horror and sense of foreboding that engulfed my very being was unlike anything I've ever yet experienced in my life before, and truly hope never to ever experience again, as once in a lifetime is just way too much for me, thank you very much. I could taste the sickly, bitter nausea rising up in the back of my throat. It was one thing for a bunch of thirteen-year-olds to end up three sheets to the wind, but it was quite another for a lone kid to fall into a water in a drunken stupor. This was not something I could have on my conscience, for if one of my son's classmates drowned on my watch, how would I ever be able to live with myself? I sprinted towards the creek, and that was when I saw him. There standing on the bridge railing, balancing on it ever so precariously, as if walking on a tightrope, was a young boy called Christopher Markham, whose arms were held up high at shoulder level, and he was clearly impaired by his inebriated mellow state of mind, and seemed to be rather enjoying himself, and was chuckling under his breath. I can fly! I can fly like a bird! Like a bird on the wind! I'm as light as a feather! In that moment I was overwhelmed with terror. This young boy was about to fall into the depths of the water, and I was in no doubt about this in my mind. He was balancing so badly, it would only take a second. And then it happened, and he plunged into the water like a large stone that just sunk to the bottom of the creek. Oh my goodness, I screamed. Help! Help! Someone! Help! I cried. Someone please help me! I was not a great swimmer, but frantically I ran into the water in all my clothes. Luckily it wasn't too cold, but it was very dark. I could barely see a thing, and I was as blind as a bat. I began swimming around feverishly, looking for the child, but I couldn't see him or find him anywhere, and I began to scream, Help! Help! Someone, please help me! Where are you, boy? I called at the top of my lungs, but the water was so still and quiet, and the only sound I could hear was the comforting, reassuring chorus of the crickets and the frogs along with my own hands splashing in the water. All of a sudden, I saw this gargantuan, dark, shadowy silhouette dashing past me in the creek on a pair of very powerful legs and then diving beneath the murky depths of the water with the swift speed, grace and efficiency of an otter. In a trice, the strange, gargantuan creature, whatever on earth it was, had retrieved the young boy and cupped its drenched body in his chest bringing him safely towards the dry land. Everything happened so quickly, but I knew without a shadow of a doubt that I was staring at a Bigfoot. The critter's long, dark hair hung on his body in wet clumps, rather like a shaggy mop. It stood proud, tall and erect, on two feet, towering at the very least seven foot tall, and possibly more, with overlong arms and powerful muscular legs. Its body was exceedingly long, lanky and lean. The chest was wide and heavily ripped with muscle definition and tension. I noted the head was shaped like a cone, folding seamlessly into the huge shoulders, and I did not discern any neck. The creature's face was not too obscure, as the light from the lanterns bounced off its silhouette, highlighting its prominent pronounced features that were remarkably human-like, although the forehead was more sloped and the nose very large and flat. As the Bigfoot put the soaked, bedraggled-looking child onto the ground, the child began to cough up water, and then bounced up on his two legs like a jumping jack, and promptly ran towards a bush, and proceeded to violently hurl up the contents of his stomach. For a second I locked eyes with the Bigfoot, and those deep-set eyes were so gentle and kind. I cannot forget how kind they were. The creature turned around, and then glided away. I could hardly believe what I had seen, for I had never believed in the likelihood of Bigfoot existing in our reality before, but now I knew very differently. And he was my hero, for I seriously doubt I would have been able to recover that child without his help. 
I am almost certain that the wild frenzied excitement of the party, along with the animated jubilant chatter and cries of the children, the loud blaring music, and the wafting delicious smells on the wind of spit roast, had certainly aroused the Bigfoot's officious inquiring mind as to what on earth was going on on my land, as usually it was very quiet. I believe he'd been watching us from the trees with an inquisitive interest and heightened curiosity, and when seeing a problematic situation arise, came to my immediate help, of which I'm eternally grateful, as I believe his discerning, perceptive eyes had watched our party rather like a movie unfolding, which he found a source of great entertainment, and the strange drunken behaviour of the children must have really boggled his mind, as it most certainly would mine. I threw out the rest of the seriously lethal punch, and I breathed a huge sigh of relief, as I was exceedingly thankful that the kids were finally sleeping over, as hopefully by morning they would have metabolised all that alcohol before their parents collected them and found out what exactly had happened. I was furious with Jonathan for lacing the punch with vodka. Truly, I wanted to kill him. All of a sudden, I saw a woman running towards me on the lawn. I groaned as I realised it was Alice Fletcher, who was Abigail's mother. She was the only punctilious mother who refused to allow her child to sleep over at the party. She was a very overprotective parent, and by the outraged, scandalised expression upon her face, I looked as if I was about to be challenged, antagonised, and even mauled by a very aggressive hyena, who was determined to give me a hard time. "'What the heck is going on here?' she piped, looking at me with an unpugnant, captious look on her face. "'You should be ashamed of yourself, Penelope. What kind of a mother are you? These thirteen-year-old kids are seriously drunk, and even your dog is completely sozzled. How does that even happen?' I'm appalled and disgusted, quite frankly, with you. Wait until I tell all the mothers about this. You mark my words, Penelope. No one will ever be attending any of Adam's future parties. I can guarantee you about that. You don't understand, I exclaimed. The punch was spiked by one of the kids. I said this, not wanting to give her any ammunition to use against me. By admitting a member of my own family was responsible for this unprecedented chaos. There's no excuse, Penelope. You're the parent. You should know what kids get up to and how naughty they are. From where I'm standing, you are definitely the guilty party. It's your responsibility as the parent to take care of them and to keep your eyes on them at all times. If they had been in my charge, I can assure you none of this would ever have transpired. I agree, I confessed. I should have guessed something was up. But I didn't, I'm afraid. The kids clearly pulled the wool over my eyes. That's no excuse, she said. I watched Mrs. Fletcher gathering her daughter Abigail and glaring at me with a hateful look on her eyes. She marched back to her car, clutching Abigail as tightly as a child clasping its teddy bear for dear life, not wanting to be parted from it for a single moment. I'd never felt so alone, abandoned and forsaken in my entire life, and from that moment on... I decided I would never ever host a children's party without my husband on side to assist me. I had fallen apart at the seams, rather like a dress that had been very badly sewn together. Looking back over that party, I truly realised that I was incredibly naive at the time, in overseeing all these young teenagers, because you really do need eyes at the back of your head like a hawk. The party guests, including my dog, thankfully fully recovered from their alcoholic binge, seemingly no worse for wear. Many of the kids described Adam's party as the best party ever, which I did find rather extraordinary, given that most of their memories of the occasion were probably obliterated by the lethal punch that had knocked them for six like a powerful anaesthetic. Maybe they enjoyed the fact that they were given cake and ice cream early at breakfast the following morning, which I have to say went down exceedingly well with the children. I felt sorry for poor Jonathan, who faced my wrath. Of course, that happened when he was sober, and believe me, I laid into that boy as hard as a dog with a bone. When I told him that a young boy nearly drowned because of his wanton carelessness, that was a huge wake-up call for him, and in that moment he burst into tears as the horror about his little prank hit him hard like a brick to the head. "'I could have killed someone!' he wailed. "'Oh, Aunt Penelope, I'm sorry. Really, I am. It was only a bit of fun.' Really, it was. 
I didn't mean to harm anyone. I'm glad to say he's grown up a lot since then. I do owe a debt of gratitude to the ghost of the caretaker for alerting me to the problem at the creek, and of course to the Bigfoot for rescuing the drowning boy, whom I seriously doubt even remembers what happened to him and how close he came that night to losing his life. I must confess that the Bigfoot side of my story is still a big secret. I haven't told anybody about it, with of course the exception of my husband. As for Mrs. Fletcher, she ensured that the mothers knew exactly what had happened to their children at Adam's party and how intoxicated they had become. I did receive scathing looks from the parents for a while, but before long other parents began to have similar problems at Kiddie's parties when they began to sneak alcohol to these events. So much for Mrs. Fletcher's famous last words, for she had declared that alcohol would never be sneaked in on one of Abigail's birthday parties. It would seem that the universe had a sense of humour after all, for it was at one of Abigail's birthday parties that the kids became seriously drunk, and so she ended up eating her own words, I'm glad to say. I'm relieved to say that after a while the fiasco of my party was soon forgotten, but for me it is an indelible event that is permanently entrenched on my memory, rather like a tattoo that is seared to the skin and can never be erased nor forgotten. So there you are. That's my story. Wow, what a story. And that must have been quite some lethal punch. Until next time, goodbye and good night.